A new car from Britain that combines the heritage of successful Grand Prix racing with some of the most modern technology to be found in an automobile. The Lagonda is a car that gets strong opinions. When it launched it was all positive. This was a new dynamic car that would lead Britain away from the 1970s doldrums like Concorde and the Intercity 125. But over time people were split. Some still considered it a great design. Some saw it as a massive blunder and not just its shape. The odd electronic dashboard and awful ergonomics surely consigned this to one of automotive's worst failures. Time magazine called it one of the 50 worst cars of all time. But what do they know? The Lagonda was a shot in the arm for Aston in the mid 70s after they ran out of money. So where did this strange shape come from? Why did such a traditional company as Aston go for an all electronic dashboard? And what came next? This is the Aston Martin Lagonda story. Nineteen seventy five was a bad year for the British car industry. The oil crisis and increasing difficulty selling cars in North America due to emissions rules tipped failing businesses over the edge. British Leyland were the biggest casualty, but Jensen Motors hit the rocks along with Aston Martin. Aston was sold by the receivers to three investors who set about turning the company around. The best way they felt to do this was with a new car, but Aston had just 100 employees. The new team had plans to raise that to 250, but even so a big budget car was out of the question. The Aston Martin V8 had a good chassis and they had a few unsold cars that needed shifting. Maybe they could give the V8 a restyle. The person to do this would be William Towns, an ex-Aston designer who styled the DBS. William got down to work, but after several iterations he proposed a better idea to management that they should build an entirely new four-door car on a modified V8 platform and have it ready for the British Motor Show in just nine months time. This fit in well with management's plans. They'd already decided their new car needed to be a four-door and releasing a two-door would kill the market for their existing cars. But they had reasons to worry about its success. The last four-door that Aston attempted, the V8 Lagonda, essentially a stretched V8, launched just two years earlier and had failed spectacularly, only seven of them were sold. The new car couldn't make the same mistake, it had to be something truly special. It would start with the shape. William produced a low-slung angular wedge design that was the latest style. British Leyland had launched the wedge-shaped Triumph TR7 and a prototype of the Lotus Esprit had been shown four years earlier. This would be the shape that would wow customers and put Aston Martin back in the black. With time of the essence he put in 12 hour days turning his sketches into a full-size model that could be used to form the aluminium panels. Just 11 engineers worked on producing the first car and when it came together it became clear just how different this car was. It was long, 5.28 meters to be exact. That wasn't as long as American cars, the Cadillac Fleetwood 75 for example clocked in at 6.35 meters, but it was going to make the new car a little hard to negotiate around a British multi-story car park. But it wasn't too far off the length of modern day cars. The 2022 long wheelbase Range Rover is only three centimeters shorter. But for the 1970s, this was a long car. Height was another matter. Like a sports car such as the Lotus Esprit, Aston's new car was essentially two tyres tall, giving it a low sports car design. So despite it being so long, the Austin Mini was actually taller and at the same time almost half the length. Aston Martin's car was also almost four times heavier than the Mini, coming in at over two metric tonnes. That shape was designed to be streamlined, but with just 12 people working on it, it wasn't like Aston was honing the shape in a wind tunnel. The new car with its low nose would get a poor 0.44 drag coefficient, which limited acceleration and top speed. All that weight and drag meant that the car needed a powerful engine. Thankfully, Aston Martin already built one, the 5.3 litre V8 allied to a manual or a Chrysler automatic. But trying to fit that large engine under the low bonnet was a tight squeeze. The solution was to move it as far back in the engine bay as possible and design a special low profile air intake. 
This had the disadvantage of low mid-range torque, but as they say, you have to make compromises for fashion. Aston would tweak the engine to give it the same power, but the car would be slower than the previous V8 Ligonda, with a lower 140 mile an hour top speed and a 0-60 time down from 6.5 seconds to 7. The previous four-door had been given the Ligonda name. This was a company Aston had bought in 1947, and had a history that went back as far as 1906, when it was founded by an American ex-opera singer, Wilbur Gunn. He'd moved to the UK and had become a speedboat and motorcycle engineer. Lagonda was the town he was born in, near Springfield, Ohio, a word corrupted from the Native American word meaning swift running. It seemed an appropriate name for Aston Martin's new fast car. The Lagonda brand is so important to Aston Martin today that it's known as Aston Martin Lagonda. The brand had been used occasionally since the purchase in 1947, but it seemed an excellent name to attach to this new high-end four-door car, something a little bit different. With just nine months until the British Motor Show, the car came together quickly. The 11-person team grew to 17 people. The V8 chassis was stretched 31 centimeters using the same suspension. Being such a luxurious car, a good deal of time went into the interior. There would be a wealth of leather, nine hides in total, and the leather-clad front seats would be electronically adjustable. Wilton carpets woven with British wool would naturally be of the highest quality. A glass panel sunroof was installed over the rear seats because, well, this car had aspirations to be a limousine, so surely the rear passengers would want a light, airy environment. But the main interior feature was the electronic instrumentation. One of Aston's new investors was Peter Sprague. He'd been chairman of National Semiconductor in Silicon Valley since 1966, and thought a computerized cockpit would make the Lagonda stand out. Mike Lowesby, the lead engineer creating the vehicle, fell in love with the idea of touch-sensitive controls after visiting National Semiconductor's offices in California. The electronic dashboard with Mike's touch-sensitive controls will be developed by the Cranfield Institute of Technology, all powered by the National Semiconductor IMP16 chip. There were high and low intensity horns for town and country use. Although the car had one fuel tank, there were filler caps on either side. No longer did you need to stretch the fuel nozzle over the car to fill up at a busy petrol station. And the Lagonda would, of course, have pop-up headlights like any supercar of the 1970s. The low bonnet design likely required it for US regulations that required the headlights to be a certain height above the road. The car was ready in nine months for the British Motor Show, sort of. Although it looked the real deal, corners had been cut. Aston's trim team had worked until 2 a.m. to get the interior ready on time. But still, the pop-up radio popped up with the aid of a mousetrap mechanism found at the last moment. The lid of the box between the seats used a hinge hurriedly removed from a toolbox. And there was a, one other minor problem. The car had no engine and transmission. <laughs> The press got a sneak peek two weeks before the motor show, and not a word of the new car had leaked out prior to this, so they were truly taken by surprise by this stunning new car. A press embargo was put on the story until the motor show, but it was broken by the BBC airing a TV show the day before the motor show. Not only that, they showed the car moving. The rest of the press were rightly annoyed at Aston for letting BBC steal their thunder, and in any case, didn't they say the car had no transmission? Well, yes, that was true. To show the Lagonda moving, the BBC had taken the car to the top of a hill and then let gravity take over. People at the 1976 British Motor Show could talk about nothing else than the Lagonda. It was on the front cover of every motoring magazine. Was this the future of transportation with such sharp lines and a futuristic dashboard? And with the level of luxury, along with Aston's claimed performance figures, it seemed you got Ferrari performance with Rolls-Royce Comfort. The price tag was £25,000. That's £157,000 in 2023. That made it one of the most expensive cars in the world, surprising when customers are happy to pay almost 30 times as much for a Bugatti Devo. But in 1976, people weren't prepared to spend that sort of money on a car. The public were excited about the Lagonda's launch, and Aston Martin took 76 orders, mostly for the Lagonda. 
This didn't necessarily help Aston's immediate bank balance worries, but it put them on a much firmer financial footing because despite managing director Alan Curtis claiming there was a one year waiting list for the V8, in reality, the company was barely ticking over. Now Aston had to get the Lagonda into customers' hands. They announced that deliveries would begin in the summer of 1977, but it soon became clear that that wasn't going to be possible. The electronics were a particular problem. In fact, in the end, it would cost four times the cost of the car just to get the electronics right. But this shouldn't have been a great surprise. Aston were putting a computer in a car when computers looked like this. No one had attempted a computerized dashboard before, whereas the mechanics of a car were well understood. As Aston were to discover, silicon chips worked well in temperature controlled buildings, but they hadn't been designed to survive Arctic winters and Gobi Desert summers. Like Morgan Motors, each car was hand built in Aston's factory, so no two Lagonda parts were truly identical, making swapping parts between cars a fun endeavor. Production of the first car slipped to spring 1978, and the price rose from £25,000 to £33,000, partly due to increasing costs, but mainly due to the 12% inflation rise. In interviews, Aston's managing director Alan Curtis could do little else than agree the price and delivery date had been a major miscalculation. Nine orders had evaporated, but on the plus side, Aston had received a further 31 orders. So despite delays, prospects looked good for Aston Martin. As William Towns was finishing his work on the Lagonda, he was asked to create a design for a British supercar that would become the Bulldog concept. One was built and I've done a video about it with a link above. There's an update to the Bulldog video as well. The car has been completely restored and there's a link to a video of the finished Bulldog in the description. Finally, the first Lagonda was ready for delivery. The press were called to drum up interest, but the night before delivery, Aston was in chaos. The car didn't work, and 14 people were working on it trying to get it fixed. The major problem was that the temperamental National Semiconductor Circuit Board was dead. The delivery day dawned, but the problems still weren't fixed. Aston seriously considered cancelling the event, but by then it was too late. The delivery was to Lady Tavistock at Woburn Abbey. Aston tried sneaking it in on a low loader, but that's pretty hard to do when the only entrance is a mile long driveway and the press have already arrived. The jig was up and Aston had to come clean that the car wasn't drivable. It was major egg on FaceTime. Aston's brochure lauded the Lagonda as a brilliant declaration of British quality, but in the end, it had been let down by an American circuit board. Aston's engineers had toiled for two straight days to get the car ready and were exhausted. After the press event, Lord Tavistock jumped into a working car and went to the Aston factory to thank each of the team personally for all of the work that they'd put in. The press weren't as barbed in the 1970s as they are today. Maybe because the British car industry were under enough pressure, they went easy on the new Lagonda, making light of this whole embarrassing situation. Aston would of course get the car running in due course, but for the first few months, whenever Lord and Lady Tavistock drove the car, they needed to be followed around by a low loader just in case a Lagonda developed another fault. But when it worked, it was wonderful. While driving down the M1 at 80 to 90 miles an hour, they saw blue flashing lights. A young policeman came up to the window. Is this the new Lagonda? Why, yes it is. My mate and I were wondering what it's like to drive. The next thing, the policeman was driving it at 100 miles an hour with Lady Tavistock in the passenger seat and with the police car struggling to keep up. Real deliveries began in 1979 once the bugs had been ironed out with production of one car per week, each taking 2,200 worker hours. And Lagonda sales were sorely needed. Aston Martin was still surviving from hand to mouth with a Lagonda waiting list reputedly over two years. Aston Martin investor Peter Sprague of National Semiconductor fame ordered one of the first Lagondas to meet US regulations. He took delivery on the Tuesday, was unable to drive it on the Wednesday due to a business meeting, and by Thursday, Aston had sold it so that they could make payroll on Friday. That car that Peter nearly owned was something special. 
the car featured self-leveling suspension, each engine was hand-built by a single person over a week, and a plaque told the owner who that was, maybe so that they knew who to complain to if there was a problem. The 1980s style sensitive touch switches, as the brochure described them, allowed the user to change between miles per hour and kilometers per hour. In an age before trip computers, the Lagonda showed average speed and fuel consumption, plus elapsed time and distance for each trip. The essential services only button limited the display to just speed, time and fuel for night driving. There was cruise control and the doors could be programmed to lock automatically on leaving the car. And it was fast. The Duke of Westminster discovered he could peg the speedometer on his stately home's two mile driveway. The landed gentry though weren't the only buyers. A good percentage were sold to the newly rich Middle Eastern oil shakes looking for a statement car. Aston produced a special desert touring package with twin air conditioners to keep up with the incessant sun that beat down through the low windscreen and sunroof. Rear air conditioning kept passengers at just the right temperature. But thanks to inflation, the price of the car had now doubled. When it launched in Australia, it was the most expensive car sold there. But boot space was less than stellar. During the design phase, the new Aston directors had sat in the seating buck to test the interior space and then signed off on it. However, things change and with the additional seat padding, the rear seats felt cramped with poor legroom. Not ideal for such a luxury car. Six feet, two inch Peter Sprague later admitted that he couldn't fit in the back of the car. Not only was it cramped, with it being so low, the small rear doors meant it was hard to get in and out. One smart ass quip that Aston had managed to build the first two passenger four door car. Splashy promotional footage showed the car being put through its paces, but even that had its problems. Aston failed to notice that there was a dent on the rear of the car. Once the sheen of excitement faded, it became clear that the touch controls, like the rear seats, weren't very ergonomic. A 7 second 0 to 60 time was nothing to sniff at, but wealthy customers always wanted more. Aston experimented with twin turbochargers that took the power from 280 horsepower to 380. It remained just a prototype, but Aston did make one special one-off Lagonda Vantage with more performance that Tyrrell's classic workshop shows off in a video in the description. Other companies offered performance improvements and some even conversions such as turning the Lagonda into an estate or a shooting brake. In 1981, Aston Martin created a separate engineers for hire team under the Tickford brand. Tickford were a coach builder that Aston Martin had bought in 1955. The new Tickford team produced custom versions of the Austin Metro and Ford Capri, and in 1983 produced the Lagonda Tickford. It had a colour match body kit, plus luxurious amenities such as front and rear TV screens, a video player, picnic tables and a drinks cabinet. Despite all these top of the line features, the Lagonda still had a manual choke, something not even the Tickford Ford Capri used. Five were sold, mostly to Middle Eastern customers, so the drinks cabinet probably only ever contained fruit juice. A year later, Aston and Tickford produced a long wheelbase version, the Lagonda Limousine. While at first glance it might seem madness to make a 5.28 meter car longer, Given the cramped rear, the extra 64 centimeters of legroom and larger rear door were sorely needed. It seems Lagonda customers rarely used the back seats though, as only three were ever ordered. In 1978, managing director Alan Curtis said he was confident they'd still be selling the Lagonda in 1985. That was bluster from a company that was running on fumes, but it proved prophetic. In fact, it would be updated as the Lagonda Series 3. The previous car would be known as the Series 2 to avoid confusion with the original Lagonda V8. The main change with the Series 3 was ditching the unreliable LED dashboard for a solution created by US company Javelina Corporation using a system they developed for the F-15 Eagle Tactical Fighter. Auto dimming TV screens showed the relevant information that made the Lagonda once again look futuristic. It was powered by just 100k of memory, and there was a disembodied computerized voice nagging you that the boot was open or you needed to fasten your seatbelt. 
maybe admitting that they weren't the future, the touch sensitive buttons were gone, with a new layout that paid scant attention to ergonomics. For example, the bonnet release button was next to the defroster, meaning on cold winter mornings you could just pop the hood rather than clearing the windows. Doug DeMuro has a good walkthrough of a Series 3 car, and again there's a link to that in the description. On the outside, the car was almost identical. The only obvious change was the side indicator, which was now ahead of the front wheel. Like other cars in Aston's range, the engine got fuel injection to help with ever-tightening US emissions rules. It gave the Lagonda a little more power and improved the awful 10 miles per gallon to a more reasonable 16 miles per gallon. At this point, sales were ticking along nicely, and Aston even considered dropping the two-door V8 to focus on Lagonda sales. Unfortunately, the TV screen dashboard proved even less reliable than the LED screen one, and later Series 3 cars used a vacuum fluorescent display, similar to that used in other cars at the time. The buttons changed again and were moved up near the screen, but some touch-sensitive buttons remained to control the trip computer. The Lagonda had been introduced in 1976, and by 1987 the folded paper design was about as fashionable as bell-bottom trousers. Like the Lotus Esprit, the Series 4 Lagonda got a softer shape thanks again to William Towns. Maybe he just chiselled the edges off the forming book. The pop-up headlights were gone now that US regulations no longer required them, and the new car sported larger 16-inch alloy wheels. The Series 4 Lagonda coincided with new ownership for Aston Martin. Ford bought a controlling stake in 1987 and immediately started updating the company. The Lagonda was a dinosaur from a different age. New Aston Martin cars could use platforms and parts from Ford's vast empire. The result was the DB7 that sold at 10 times the rate of the quirky, unergonomic Lagonda, whose looks now stood out for all the wrong reasons. Its design had been so of the moment at its launch in 1976, but as with fashions, they come and go quickly, and by the late 1980s, it was an archaic relic, especially compared to modern rivals. The very thing that drew customers to the car in 1976 put them off 10 years later. Production of the Lagonda ended in the first month of 1990, after selling a total of 645 cars around the world. Aston looked to revive their fortunes with another Lagonda, the Rapide concept in 1988, styled by Italian coach builder Zagato. Unfortunately, it never got past a concept. Five years later, Aston tried again, this time with the four-door Lagonda Vignale, styled by Ghia. It was the antithesis of the Lagonda's straight lines. Even the wing mirrors were circular. Inside it was a sea of circles as well, but with very analogue gauges. It gave a hint of the Jaguar S-Type that would follow it in another five years. Based on the Lincoln Town Car platform, there was some interest in taking it forward, but Ford decided it would be too expensive to revive the Lagonda brand that was relatively obscure. They were having enough trouble trying to revive the Aston Martin brand. So that was about it for the Lagonda. Aston focused on the DB7, which got high praise, and they went back to being the purveyors of two-door Grand Tourers, being sold off the back of James Bond films and odd Englishmen driving them around an airfield. Aston Martin changed hands once more in 2007, so it was maybe natural that the new owners once more looked into the Lagonda heritage. With the Aston Martin name attached to two-door Grand Tourers, the Lagonda name would be used for their crossover concept in 2009. Well, Aston Martin didn't say the dreaded C word. This was a four-seat international tourer. It was really a crossover. In the end, it would come to nothing, but the profitability of SUVs and crossovers is too hard to ignore if a car company wants to stay in business, so Aston Martin would eventually launch the DBX in 2020. Many in the Middle East had fond memories of the Lagonda, so maybe a revival of the original car would make sense. Aston presented the Lagonda Taraf in 2014. Taraf meant ultimate luxury in Arabic, and the four-door saloon would initially only be sold in the Middle East. The car was engineered by Aston Martin's Q division that makes bespoke cars, because of course the company that makes James Bond's car has a Q division. Development had taken just two years, a lot less than the original Lagonda. They probably had more than 17 people working on it. 
Production of the £685,000 limited edition car began in 2015 and ended a year later after selling 120 exclusive cars. Aston saw the Lagonda name as a future brand they could use to take on Bentley and Rolls-Royce, so they launched two concepts to test the waters. The first was the 2018 Vision Saloon with a design maybe as stunning as the 1976 Lagonda Series 2. It was followed up with a crossover, sorry, an all-terrain vehicle concept in 2019 using the same styling cues. Any hopes these would come to market faded after a series of poor financial results. It was time to batten down the hatches and focus on making a profit with new executive chairman Lawrence Stroll. But with Lagonda in the company's name, we can be sure that one day the Lagonda name will return. Aston can't have made much money on the Lagonda. They went through three generations of instrumentation technology at extraordinary cost, and none of them worked particularly well. When Evil Knievel bought a Lagonda, he removed the dashboard and installed regular dials. Sometimes it's good to be first to market, sometimes it isn't, but Aston seemed to bet on the wrong technology. Why was a digital dashboard better? Why were touch sensitive controls better? No one stopped to ask that question, not even motoring journalists at the time. Even Mike Lowsby, the Lagonda's chief engineer who thought of using touch sensitive controls, eventually called it a totally bad idea. These G Wiz features were cutting edge and modern and certainly helped sell cars to rich customers looking for a state symbol over something more humdrum. But for a car to be useful as a daily driver, ergonomics need to be the main focus. Companies like BMW and Mercedes made stylish cars that didn't go wrong, were the height of luxury and were easy to drive. No wonder that when Bill Gates was the richest man in the world and could afford any car he wanted, his daily driver was a Mercedes S-Class. Of course, this hasn't stopped touch sensitive flat screens becoming ubiquitous despite being less ergonomic than push buttons, but these offer many advantages. They're cheaper for one, and they offer much greater functionality that can be updated without having to change the physical controls. Screens can display any information at any time, and they can of course still mimic classic dials. The Lagonda with its exciting shape and electronics generated a lot of interest in Aston Martin, and it clearly had a role in Aston's survival. It was the main car produced by Aston Martin in the early 1980s. Like bell bottoms, it's gone through being the height of fashion in the 70s, through the phase of being utterly unfashionable, to being seen by some as a true classic. If you want to see my history of the Aston Martin Bulldog supercar that William Towns designed, there's a link to the video on the right. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.